Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, all the delegates as well as the audience. Uh, it's a great privilege to welcome each and every one of you for this uh, first webinar from the nephrology portfolio, uh, on which is supported uh, by Microlabs Limited, which is a Bangalore-based company in India. Uh, it's been a real honor to have all the uh, leading panelists uh, of nephrologists across the country, uh, in which we have Dr. P.P. Varmaji, we have Dr. A.K. Balla, we have Dr. Sunil Prakashji, we have Dr. Uh, Vinay Sakuja, we have Dr. Vijay Kerr, and uh, all the seniors. So it's a great opportunity to uh, welcome each and every one of you for this uh, uh, today's topic, which is basically COVID-19 and the kidney. So we have the fixed agenda, as you must all have uh, received already. So I take uh, this opportunity to welcome one and all of you, and thank you very much for sparing your valuable time. So now I request uh, Dr. P.P. Varmaji to take over from here and introduce the speakers and then go into the uh, overview about COVID-19 and the kidney. Over to you, Dr. Pipi Verma. Thank you, Mr. Raja. Yes. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, on my own behalf, and on behalf of this illustrious, respected, and senior faculty, welcome you all to this webinar on COVID-19 and the kidney. In the last couple of weeks, all of you must be hearing and must be gaining knowledge from webinars on different aspects of kidney. There have been talks about uh, in webinar about dialysis, COVID and transplantation, and all these have been very, very useful and informative. I can only say that this webinar is a continuum of learning knowledge on the fields of COVID-19 and the kidney. Uh, uh... We we assure you that it should be a very compact and a practical type of webinar. Keeping in mind the rapidly growing field of COVID, as a matter of fact, I was just reading um, Mr. Dr. Horton of Lancet, who was mentioning that every day he is receiving 30 to 40 articles in Lancet for publication. And you can imagine about the other journals what is happening. And many of these articles are getting published without peer review. And some of them are getting published straight away from desk. So therefore, whatever knowledge we are getting, some of them may be contradictory. Some of them may get negated in near future. So what we will be talking today will be as we know today and hope that it stays like that for some time. Just to introduce the panelist, I will be moderating the session. Uh, then we have got, I'll also give a introduction and overview about COVID, little bit reference to nephrology. I'll be followed by Dr. Sunil Prakash, who is head of nephrology and transplantation at BLK Hospital. He shall be talking on AKI and COVID. This will be followed by Professor Dr. A.K. Bhalla Padamshri, Chairman Gangaram Hospital. He shall be talking on a very interesting and important field of dialysis population and COVID, how to manage them. After that, will be a very respected, my teacher and Dr. Bhalla's teacher also, Professor Vinay Sakuja, Professor Emeritus at PGI Chandigarh, who will be talking on the testing, lab testing about COVID, when to do, what to do. And finally, a very revered and popular teacher, Professor Vijay Kher, he will be talking on nonsense of transplantation and COVID. So I think uh, I will start with the, my topic, that is introduction and overview of this. The slide I have to move. Yeah. This is... So... We all know that it is a story of almost last three and a half months. 31st December was the first report of cluster of cases of pneumonia of unknown origin from China, Wuhan. It is a story of Wuhan and Hunan. Very fast, in a couple of days, this virus was identified as coronavirus 2 by through the bronchoalveolar lavage of a patient. So initial some cases were associated 
and related to who announced a sea market, seafood market, which for your information got closed on 1st of January this year. February 11, WHO renamed the disease as COVID-19, that is coronavirus disease 19. And a month later, on 11th March, they declared it as a pandemic. If you look at the magnitude of the problem in three and a half months, where we are, today we have got almost 2 million cases of this disease. 30% of the load is shared by USA alone. Almost 48% of the burden is in Europe. And rest 20 to 25% is being shared by the rest of the world. If we see today, we have got over 2 million cases. There have been unfortunate 120,000 deaths. And the disease has engulfed and created terror in 210 countries. If you look at on the economic front, this has been a very, very bad time. Over $1 trillion have already been lost. After many years, the GDP of the world has dipped below 2%. And the global economy has already shrunk by 1%. And if the same thing continues, we may be heading for a doomsday in the economy. Well, Coming to the first publication which appeared in Lancet, that was 41 cases of pneumonia in China. And these cases, almost two thirds of them, were having history of exposure to Honanan seafood market. Well, after that came the next publication of 425 cases of pneumonia, again from China. And if you can see the brown, dark brown bars below, these are the association with seafood market. But logically, once on 1st of January, this market was closed. After 14th of January, there is no association. And today we know that disease is spread from human to human. Now, if you look at the intermediate host, we know that the virus has got a homology with bat virus, 88%. It is coming from bats. But unlike the SARS and MERS virus, where you had the intermediate host, whether it was a severe cat or it was a camel, we do not know what is the intermediate host for this virus. Pangolin, pangolin is basically an anteater, what we find in our forest. This is a scaly creature, almost a meter long. It survives basically on worms and ants. It licks them. The pangolin was thought to be the culprit intermediate host, because they found that 70% of the pangolins were harboring this virus. And one of the studies pointed out that 99% homology with human coronavirus was there. And as I said, the science is changing. This was contradicted soon when they said it is not a total genetic homology. It was only some attachment portion, attachment of study, attachment of the bond, binding area which was studied only which had homology. So this pangolin theory was also given up. As of today, we are not sure what is the intermediate host. I think time will tell what it is. Well, coming to the pneumonia and the risk factors, this is the largest data which published last week in JAMA. There's a data of almost all cases which occurred in China, 72,000 cases, and 62% of these were confirmed cases. As you see, the disease, as we all know, that in 80% of the cases, it's a mild disease. And 20% of the cases, it is bad. In 15%, we call it severe. And 5%, it is really critical. Now, who are the people actually who are going to develop this critical or severe disease? Or what are the risk factors? If you look at, this is the data from three studies which have come from China. If you combine them, you will find that practically two-thirds of the patients had one or the other comorbidity, that is either hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart disease, or cerebral vascular disease. Now, if you look at the U.S. data, which got published just three days back, they just studied 7,162 COVID patients. These are not serious or any other patient, just normal COVID patients. And they find 
that almost 37, almost 40% patient had some comorbidity. And if you look at the hospitalized patient or critically ill patient, it was 70 to 80% of the people had some other, other comorbidity. So what is important is the comorbidity. If you look at the effect of age, this is the Chinese data on elderly, the, the fatality data. As you find that people who are over 80 years of age, the mortality is almost 15%. And younger population, there is pro probably practically no mortality or 0.1 to 0.2% mortality. Now, if you look at the Italian data, the fatality in Italy is 12.7% as on today of the total cases. Because Italy has got the second largest elderly population in the world. Japan is the leader. They have got the maximum number of elderly population, followed by Italy, where 23rd percent of the population is over 65 years of age. Mind you, in India, 6.1% of the population is over 65 years of age. And almost 99% of these people had at least one, and 48.6, almost 50%, had three or four more, more, more comorbidities. So what is important is to accept that it is an advanced age and presence, presence of comorbidities, which gives the risk of fatality for this virus. Coming to the mode of transmission, we all know it is a droplet transmission. But in between, there was a theory which came that aerosols are also causing it. We know the size of droplet is more than 5 microns, and aerosols are generally less than 5 microns. This was a study which came in NEJM on 17th March, a month back. What they did, they generated aerosols were generated by use of three jet collision nebulizers. And after generating it, they put it in the Goldsberg drum to create an aerosolized environment. Then they mentioned, they brought out that the aerosols persisted in the drum for over three hours, creating a fear that possibly the aerosolized form, if it is there, it can remain infective in the air, which created a fear in people's mind. And they also, in the drum, they placed different metals. And if you see the brown one, this is with the, our coronavirus too that is COVID, and this is blue one is the SARS virus. What basically you are finding with copper and cardboard, the contact period that is not much, the virus dies, but with stainless steel and with plastic, it is more. After they published that, a clarification came from WHO. As I said, whatever you publish, again, the clarification comes. The recent publication they mentioned, it's the WHO language, the recent publication in NEGM has said persistent of COVID virus. They said this is an experimental study. The generation of aerosol is by three jet collision nebulizers, which are fed. This is a high-powered machine, which is not in natural condition, and don't remain fearful about that. And they said further, the finding that the particles remain up to three hours does not reflect a clinical setting. But what is important to know that aerosolized form can stay there. So there are some subset of patients, like for example, if somebody is getting a CPR, somebody is getting a mechanical ventilation, somebody is getting a tracheostomy, somebody is getting an endotracheal intubation, somebody is trying to be made prone from supine position. These are the situations when the aerosol form can come. So one has to be careful about such settings. The last point I want to discuss is which is again intrigued, how the disease, how the virus is actually causing the disease. We know that there is ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, which is there at many areas in the body. For example, on tongue and in mouth, there is very high density of ACE. ACE is found in lung, especially the basal lungs. ACE is found in kidney. ACE is found in... Uh, Intestine, it is found in heart, it is found in blood vessels, at many places. Now, what happens? The coronavirus is called corona. Corona means a crown. So the virus has got crown, S-protein, the spike protein on this. 
Now this spike protein has to get attached to, if you look here below, I'm pointing out this. This is the ACE2 receptor. So first it has to come in contact with this and bind it. Once it binds, then the second step is, there's the transmembrane uh, receptor, serine based, and then this has to do the priming. For example, if you look at, this is a ACE, this is the virus, virus comes, it has come and bound. Now the other portion of the spike protein will bound. This is again, more and more will bind. Eventually, you find all over, these are ACE and ACE, at the virus proteins are bound. After it is bound, eventually, then the TMPR, or transmembrane protein, this causes a priming of protein, and only after that, the virus enters. Now, this is only a diagram which is trying to show that what is important is the receptor binding domain, the RBD. Because the research will be, if you can create some antibodies against receptor binding protein, possibly the binding will not occur. Now, if you go by steps, so we say, this is the last slide of mine, AS2 expression besides lung is also seen in liver, heart, kidney, and blood vessel. Virus spike protein fuses with AS2 receptor before entering. Then the TMPRR interacts with the receptor and primes it. Inside the cell, it fuses with endosome and multiplies in the acidic milieu. In patients who are taking ACE inhibitor or ARPS, there is upregulation of receptors. Anybody will say, if there is upregulation of receptors, logically more virus is going to bind. So this is going to be dangerous. And once again, another point, the people who are believer in chloroquine hypothesis, one should know that chloroquine, once it goes inside in the endosome, it creates a basal, basic uh, pH. From acidic pH, it is changing the pH towards base. So therefore, in the basic pH, the virus cannot multiply. They believe that possibly one of the hypotheses that it may be working there. Anyway, coming back to the same point, if ACE and ARPS are upregulating the receptor, so what is happening? Why the disease is not occurring more? We do really don't have a fixed answer, but possibly it may be a hypothesis that if there is increased upregulation, that also may be there is increased shedding of receptor. So if this receptor is shed and lying in the alveoli, this may be accept, taken as a decoy receptor for the coronavirus, which might be binding there. Or it is also possible that in the upregulated, once the spike protein fuses with that, that TMPRSS does not interact or it does not prime it. It may be possible that ACE, which creates angiotensin II, causes some configurational change in the receptor. Therefore, the entry of the virus is inhibited. What we know today, that if you downregulate the receptor, disease is more severe. If you delete the receptor by any antibody, disease will be more severe. If you upregulate, Rather, the trials maybe if you can give ACE uh, receptor to people, if you can give ACI to people, the trial is also on that if it can prevent or make the disease milder. Well, this is where we are today. I think I will stop here. Now, I will invite uh, Dr. Sunil Prakash, who will be talking on AKI and COVID. As I mentioned, we also know today that AKI, I, I will not dwell, he will dwell on that how common or how uncommon is this, why it is occurring, and whatever it is occurring, what form of RRT we should give it to them. Over to Dr. Sunil Prakash, please. Thank you, General Verma, for a very excellent uh, position of the talk. You have set the ball rolling. And uh, I wish to uh, welcome all the listeners who are there. Uh, welcome. and. Uh, as we get going, I just want to start that this problem is, we, as we all know, it is by the cough and sneeze of the patient who has the virus. And normally it will go up to 1.5 meters. And that is why the recommendations are to keep at a two meter distance. So if somebody is at a two meters distance, most of the virions will fall be behind. 
but once in a while if somebody has a large spray like nebulization or something then maybe uh, it may go even up to 6 meters so once in a while especially in procedures and uh, suctions and uh, nebulization one has to be extremely careful and they are rather contraindicated friends we all know that initially in most of the people the symptoms may be very mild there may be fever which may not be very challenged then some cough which is mostly dry diarrhea headache are common and if you do a lab at that time you have lymphopenia some deranged prothrombin time remember it's a coagulant state and you have increased d dimer and a mild rise in ldh normally these tests are not done at this point of time and as the virus has set in the body and they are going down uh, slowly where is the problem the problem is the host takes place in a very big way the inflammatory response of the host sets the ball rolling in a negative way the person becomes hypoxic is doesn't maintain the saturation over time you have abnormal chest findings you have transaminitis you have low procal and it is mostly the pulmonary phase which is going from bad to worse to a point when it may land up into adult respiratory acute respiratory distress shock cardiac failure renal failure and you have a plethora of the lab sitting here you have crp ldh il6 d dimer ferritin drops and pro bnp everything is up there and this is so in other word we can also say a person who has a very uh, aggressive immune response maybe will have uh, more severe outcomes and possibly that is why as we notice in ckd patients with their poor immune status they do not mount such a vehement pulmonary response and at the bottom i have shown some therapies which are being worked upon so and they would uh, be acting at different levels and uh, i think subsequently they will be covered so how does it get going as professor verma had very told you very elegantly the virion finds its way inside the body the mucosa it comes to the antigen presentation and the same process goes through it goes through cell immunity where t cd4 cells and cd8 cells are activated it is presented to the cells and the b immunity also comes into the picture and subsequently memory cells are formed but the problem is that the both immune processes lead to increased formations of cytokines il b1 il6 il8 cxl10 ccl ca3 ccl5 and there's a very severe immune response to the lungs which leads to ards and uh, shock and all those things so it is basically the cytokine storm which is such a huge problem in these patients and they require very intensive management doctor uh, sorry to interrupt uh, i am sharing your screen uh, i just wanted to know if it is correct sir sir you let us know when you wanted to change the slide he will change it for you okay so uh, so can i just see the screen i've just put on the new slide is it okay is it going the slide is going one minute so no sir you have not shared the screen i have shared it oh so i think i'll shut off my screen i think yes sir yes sir so maybe uh, i'll go. is it okay now uh, so you are holding on to it perfect yes. so we, we just talked about cytokine storm and uh, the implications like ards and all can i have the next slide <laughs> next please and this is about the virus the virus has many proteins the m protein is responsible for the uh, transmembrane transport of the nutrients and subsequently when the virions multiply in the cell it helps in the release of the bud after giving them an envelope but the cake of the matter are the s proteins which are s1 and s2 types it is the s2 type which is of interest to us and this will mediate the viral cell response by fusion with hr1 and hr2 next next yeah so s the s2 no just go back please the s2 sub unit s2 sub unit contains a fusion peptide which will fuse with the cell it has a transmembrane domain and a cytoplasmic domain which will see through it through the cytosomes and cytoplasm 
and friends many anti viral drugs are also being uh, being worked upon to act at this s2 level as an anti s2 therapy so once this s2 gets going then you have some n proteins and e proteins their functions are not really well understood by us and some uh, single stranded rnas are sitting there but all in all we are concentrating mostly on s2 proteins and m proteins to understand the pathophysiology multiplication and the further implications of this virus next slide please and professor verma shared this slide suffice to say that he dwelt at length and it is the binding of s protein on ace receptors and dpp4 which causes injury through its cytopathic effects cytokine release and other mediators friends we all know that ace is almost 100 fold high in kidneys than lung so i was perturbed that since it is so high titer on the kidneys kidney will have a very big hit but subsequently my slides as i have gone through the literature have brought out a reasonably confusing picture so i assure you i leave you as confused as i am as of now next please symptomatology in passing hypoxic you all know they have very difficult times to maintain saturations hypotension then new onset organ dysfunction kidney by creatinine being up 50% from baseline or reduction in urine output to less than 0.5 ml per hour, kg per for 6 hours and then if gcs score is down or any other major organ dysfunction is a sign of a big problem next please so pathogenesis is unclear because whenever many uh, etiologies are implicated so pathogenesis is unclear but there are interplay of many factors most often it is atn due to dehydration leading to a pre renal failure then toxic tubular damage has been implicated by massive cytokine storm with or without rhabdomyolysis cytopathic action of the virus that invades the ace expressing cells on the kidneys on the tubules and causes aki and then drugs which are given also bring in their problems next please so all in all cytokine damage organ crosstalk and systemic effects of the disease will bring down the kidneys next please so here the cytokine damage and this slide tells us what we can do about it as this point of time so in cytokine release syndromes which may be due to the disease itself and when we bring in ecmo we bring in inv invasive ventilation and or crrt it also on one hand causes cytokine removal by various approaches but at the same time it may also aggravate the cytokine which we know in ecmo in other situations also but high dose crrt with without ecmo and uh, other modalities are being tried in very very sick patients then organ cross talk cardiomyopathy sets in with or without viral myocarditis you have cardio renal syndromes type 1 acute people have been given alvad and av ecmo alveolar damage renal medullary hypoxia is associated with this again venovenous ecmo or crrt would help high peak airway pressures intra abdominal pressures could also lead to aki by renal compartment syndrome again one would need crrt rhabdomyolysis we all know tubular toxicity same old story requiring crt with or without ecmo then systemic effects are like positive fluid balance in these patient will give you renal compartment syndrome uh, endothelial damage third spacing rhabdomyolysis and endotoxin causing septic aki and there is a some papers which suggest role of polystyrene fibers with polymyxin etc next slide free to remove them so incidence of aki is very variable in all the papers exact incidence of aki with covid is unclear but what we know is that in esrd patients are exceptionally vulnerable to this infection by virtue of their poor immune status and they may require in hospital status next please this is a report from chung et al he had 700 patients 52 were males and 42 were severe and nearly the same about comorbidities and the kidney abnormalities which were found was about 13 14% of raised bun creat and loss of gfr decreasing gfr and 40% 44% had proteinuria 26 had hematuria and 5.1% were reported to have pure aki and he has shown a negative association of all these uh, factors of aki and he has concluded that clinicians should be specially aware of the aki in these settings 
So this came up in Kidney International last week. Next, please. COVID infection is a special threat to patients on dialysis, which Professor Bala will cover. In this paper from Puans, there were nearly more than 7,000 patients in 61 centers. But in one center in this paper, they had 37 patients out of 230 who developed COVID infection and seven died. But six had causes not related to COVID. They had cardiovascular causes and not directly related to COVID. So this is what it said. But patients on COVID had less lymphopenia, lower serum levels of inflammatory cytokines, and milder clinical diseases than other patients with COVID-19. Possibly because we understand this is due to their poor immune status, that they do not come as a classical ARDS like non-CKD would come. Next, please. So AKI available data suggests that the prevalence of AKI in CKD is low in a Chinese cohort of more than 1,000 patients in which 93 were hospitalized, 91% had pneumonia, 5.3 were in ICU, and 3.4 had respiratory distress, ARDS. But AKI was seen only in 0.5%. And uh, so in this study, at least the AKI per se, de novo was not so common. Next, please. Then Cheng et al. in this study said that they are fairly common. He said 44% had proteinuria and creat were deranged in 15% of patients and AKI occurred in 3.2% of patients. He also said that patients who do have kidney impairment will have a very high risk of in-hospital death. Next, please. So coronavirus, this paper says 19 does not result in AKI. He had analyzed 116 hospitalized patients from Wong's group. Next. But Medrex preprint on kidney function 59 patients by Corona reported 63% showing proteinuria and 19% had deranged KFT. CT scan showed abnormalities of the kidney in all the patients. So he contradicts the above paper and says that AKI is not so uncommon. Next, please. Then Zen et al included 193 patients of which 128 were non-severe, 65 were severe, and 32 died. Of the 28 patients of other pneumonias were also included prior to COVID outbreak to compare. So in the hospital, a fraction had a kidney dysfunction, which was significant, 59% with proteinuria and nearly 15% with deranged KFT. So he said AKI although was mild, but if it was present, with pneumonia, the outcomes were very guarded. Next, please. And these are various case studies. I will not go into detail. Just concentrate on this bar. And the variation of AKI is from 0.5 to nearly 19%. And uh, so I think I'm sure the jury is not yet out about the prevalence of AKI. Next, please. And here, what they are trying to show is AKI with mortality. So in this 4% AKI, if the creatinine was more than 1.5% on presentation, it rose to in 45% deranged KFT before deaths. And uh, mortalities were again variable. But one thing is coming up very clearly, that if a patient had AKI, for example, in this Chen's study, out of 29, 28 patients succumbed to illness. And in this also, they showed a very high mortality, 23% had AKI, and of all them, 11 had CKD. So if they have an AKI, 27 or 28 died in this group. Next, please. Finally, friends, all I can say is that this slide just tells us the amount of good work that is going on. We do not have to end on a negative note. A lot of work is going on at all levels of the virus interaction with the human body, and they are working on it. For example, at this chemostat, micellate has come in. They are working on it here, toclizomib. Sarilumab, and then structural protein, and then you have lupinavir, darunavir sitting here, ribavirin and favinaspar acting on RNA-dependent polymerase, and so on and so forth. So I personally believe that the mankind will win over this very formidable foe, and I'm optimistic about it. It's just a matter of time. Till such time, social distancing and being very, very vigilant and bright is the way to keep. Thank you for your very patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Sunil, for uh, giving an overall picture of AKI. What you rightly said, the incidence may not be very high, but if they, it is there, the mortality becomes pretty high. Well, the next speaker, we will have questions at the end. 
the next speaker is professor ak balla uh, in between sunil did mention that a wuhan study that is a solitary study that patients had ckd patients dialysis population had covid but possibly they had a milder form of disease is it really true and the big but but important thing is what is bothering everyone how to manage our dialysis population and dialysis scenario professor bhalla please thank you janav verma may i have the slide please Uh, good evening, all the panelists and all the colleagues who have joined this uh, webinar. Um, now uh, we we have all seen hepatitis B positive era. Then we saw hepatitis C positive era, and then we had HIV positive era. And now we have faced a fourth one that is now COVID nineteen. There, there was all the time there was a steer whenever we used to see a patient of hepatitis b there was isolation and no technician no nurse used to touch the patient then the dangerous one came hepatitis c virus where there was no vaccination and then there was a risk of transmission but then hiv was real era when the uh, really technicians nurses doctors were avoiding these patients but here is a disease which is highly contagious and we, this is a pandemic and in a pandemic even healthy population is being affected disease population is being affected so that is a, a real cause of worry and hemodialysis patients who are definitely cannot be spared whenever there is a pandemic we don't know it is said that maybe 60 to 80% of the population will get infected due to corona, uh, this covid 19 infection we are still only 3 and 1/2 months old with the knowledge of this virus so there is total scientific experience is not with having any randomized control studies so whatever somebody uh, whatever studies are there they are such a very short period and without um, much evidence based uh, journals and publications so we have to be at that now what makes these patients vulnerable or susceptible because of pre existing comorbidities repeated unavoidable exposure to hospital environment they are coming twice or thrice a week and for years together they are uh, uh, being faced with other uh, infected patients in the hospital immune spread state due to ckd stage 5 and maybe that that is helping in our favor in these patients that already highlighted that we don't uh, get that kind of cytokine uh, storm in these patients like hepatitis c virus or hepatitis b virus infection didn't cause fulminant hepatic failure so on the same logic we do not get that kind of uh, serious uh, complications uh, in these patients they are prone to develop uh, complications as compared to general population otherwise also because of immune spread state and secondary infections septicemia short icu admissions and the symptoms may not be classical seen and may be due to image, uh, different sim symptoms because of, because of immune spread state as already highlighted in both the speaker the main study was from wuhan where 237 patients the 16% of dialysis patients became covid 19 positive but the point to be seen here is that out of these 16 patients none of the patient died because of complication related to virus infection they all died because of either mi or cva or other things but not because again highlighting the fact that they did not get that kind of severe disease and again another point of concern is 12% of healthcare workers became positive in that study so that is a very very important because this virus doesn't spare anybody that is the reason that we are all scared in how to handle dialysis patients and how to handle dialysis units and uh, now uh, after, once we had this concern that dialysis patients are at higher risk then indian society of nephrology uh, became active and i was also part of this uh, guidelines so we we made certain guidelines and we uh, presented these guidelines to ministry of uh, yeah. health and family welfare and after that the revised guidelines were circulated by, by ministry of health and family throughout the country and by and large these are the guidelines to be followed by all the hemodialysis units in the country now these patients first of most important thing is the first thing the patient comes is as you have already seen patients are very much scared to come to dialysis unit because because of risk of infection even patients don't do not want to come for blood test uh, to the laboratory 
and if we tell them to come to casualty somehow they want that they can show us in a clinic outside but will not like to come to so here is a patient who will like to um, shift from thrice a week to twice a week dialysis from twice a week to once a week dialysis uh, i am sure everyone will be facing this problem the patients on regular dialysis should adhere to prescribed schedule and not miss their dialysis session to avoid any emergency dialysis i think this is a point you have to highlight to your patients and uh, stress it that if you miss the dialysis then emergency dialysis may not be possible at your center now now imagine like here you are sitting in your dialysis unit so how will you will plan the um, uh, things in this situation so all units should instruct their patients to recognize early symptoms of covid 19 like fever sore throat cough shortness of breath dyspnea uh, rhinorrhea myalgia body aches fatigue and diarrhea and please uh, mention these three uh, fever cough and sore throat that there you have to make a performer and get that performer filled up from the patient where you must uh, have in the, their history of any uh, place where there is there, there was a focus of patients or cluster of patients or like uh, we had in delhi then whether a patient had any history of uh, foreign travel so all, every dialysis you must get the performer feed from the patient St stable patients should be encouraged to come to the unit without any attendant because the practice had been at many centers that one attendant used to sit with the patient and that i think you have to strictly uh, abolish that practice and they, you have to reduce the crowd to the minimum in the dialysis unit now you have to have a screening area if you can afford that before you enter the dialysis unit make a small area or a, uh, in the corridor a small where you have to first screen the patients with adequate spacing and social distancing it is very important every patient should be asked about symptoms history of contact then whether any travel to for, as i mentioned then symptom at patients they have in the guidelines mentioned that every patient need not have face mask but symptomatic patient only should have face mask but in like in our dialysis unit and i will recommend here also now even government of india has also at least government of delhi has made it mandatory to wear face mask for every person whether healthy or diseased so i think face mask should be mandatory whosoever is entering the dialysis unit you have to provide the sanitizers at the entry so that they wash their hands proper uh, they sanitize sanitize their hands properly now coming to testing as well as referral all suspected patients of covid 19 should be tested with real time pcr test as per government of india protocol now this is very important that mm -hmm. your patients who are old patients on maintenance hemodialysis if you get these symptoms then you should send this patient to your flu clinic or fever clinic which i am sure every hospital will be having that should be in the emergency room or casualty so that is that is a practice uh, in fact at our center that whenever we find any patient with uh, fever or cough or sore throat or severe myalgia or uh, unexplained breathlessness then we send the patient to our emergency and we uh, test the um, uh, real time pcr and fda has approved a test that is qualitatively identifying immunoglobulins igm and igg antibodies against uh, sars cov2 the serology testing will be an important tool to understand the population immunity and distinguish these individuals who are at lower risk of reinfection or whether this will show us whether this is any development of herd immunity uh, in the population and especially healthcare workers now once the patient comes into dialysis unit the suspected or positive covid patients we should have uh, uh, all these patients should have disposable three layer surgical mask throughout the dialysis session so no patient in dialysis unit should be without mask patient should wash their hands with soap before um, dialysis and you should uh, tell the uh, train their patients uh, this tough tough attitudes like uh, cover your mouth with tissue uh, and that tissue paper should be thrown in the dustbin and every uh, machine uh, side, bed side there should be a dustbin on every bed so that you have the and dust bin also individually for every bed as well as tissue papers on on each bed now if patient is suspected or positive patient then ideally you should be this patient should be dialyzed in isolation although guidelines that's why the revised guidelines came because every center may not have separate hospital right we are lucky to have a, at gandaram hospital we have a separate hospital 
a totally separate building which has been designated as a covid positive hospital so no covid no covid covid positive patient will be admitted in our main building of dandaram hospital if you cannot afford that then you can do is i can have a isolation room in the dialysis room but that room should have a closed door so you should have a separate staff uh, dialyzing these patient there and those uh, they should have all um, uh, P, uh, ppe of level 3 and like we uh, handle these covid 19 positive patients if you don't have a isolation room then you can still manage with the last shift of the day and then patient may be dialyzed at a if still uh, you can do that or you can even dialyze the patients in the uh, in the row end in the end of last machine within the unit ensuring the separation from all other patients by at least 2 meters now for dialysis staff in fact protective equipment this personal from ppe is must but the level may not be 3 as uh, handling uh, positive patients but at least you should you should have shoe cover you should have it brown followed by a plastic brown gloves and a mask which should be prefer if you can afford the n95 that is preferred if you don't have n95 then even circular mask but face shield is very important because that that will prevent the droplet infection in these patients uh, separating the equipment like stethoscope thermometer or oxygen saturation probes blood pressure cuffs in between the patient shifts you must clean and disinfect all this equipment that mm -hmm. is what is we are doing at our center that in in between the shifts with 1% hypochlorite you have to sanitize the building uh, this uh, bed as well as machine stethoscope bp apparatus all these things have to be sanitized in between the shifts it may take some extra time but this is a mandatory requirement this is just to show that how we have totally stopped attendance in our center and see that we have a proper uh, six feet distance between the machines and that is how our uh, unit looks looks like we can, we have three main uh, cubicles like that and this is one of our dialysis technician that is how we are following at our center he is wearing a face shield also now these healthcare providers should still report temperature absence of symptoms each day prior to starting work so we must have a thermo scan available at the entry so that uh, every patient as well as healthcare worker we uh, report the temperature and if the in the face mask i, I already have sent the sufficient quantity of face mask should be available so that there should not be any uh, shortage because the mode of entry of infection is via uh, nose mouth and eyes uh, through eyes and so this face has to be covered that is most important thing preferably you put these technicians and nurses on six hour shift so that we do you don't put them on very long uh, shifts and every 14 days you should have a rotation if you can afford then you can make two teams so one team will work for 14 days and another team will work for 14 days that will be further uh, doing the prevention of spread of infection but the thing is that we have a, a incubation period also which varies from from, from 7 days to 14 days or even longer also so that somehow to, in incubation period one cannot be very sure even when the review get report as negative plus you have false positive and false yes. negative reports also so to counter that i think best thing in today's scenario will be that every patient you presume to be uh, covid positive unless and until proved otherwise so what is the answer for that universal precautions as we were doing in uh, hiv patients i think same thing holds true today also so all universal precautions must be strictly followed hand washing these seven steps we know because we have been handling capd patients since last about three decades so our patients also are know very well so i think now this has to be practiced in hemodialysis patients also as well as healthcare workers also then hand hygiene already highlighted if you don't have the sanitizer available at least soap and water is readily available so at least minimum 20 seconds of washing with soap uh, sh uh, should be mandatory if you don't have the sanitizer and if you see the hands are soiled visibly or dirty then you ask them to wash first with soap and water and then with uh, sanitizer with sanitizer should be having at least 60% alcohol mm -hmm. now once we uh, as i mentioned in between the shifts you uh, sanitize with uh, hypochlorite but in the night what we do is that we usually formalize 
the machine with either hydrogen peroxide solution or silver nitrate solution uh, no dear these days we are not using uh, formalin but best is to use uh, hydrogen peroxide and or you plus uh, you do sanitization with the uh, 1% hypochlorite this has to be uh, treatment has to be done for bedside rotor dialysis machine door knobs light switches counter tops handles desk phone which is very important that every phone has to be sanitized keyboards toilets and sinks ask the patient to not discourage them to bring phone in the room because uh, phone again, uh, again can uh, spread the infection it is like any fomite causing uh, the spread then second is that avoid outside eatables during the dialysis so for that what we have done is our dietary, dietary department is giving us the support so they are giving proper uh, meals during the dialysis session and only one person comes from the dietary department and he distributes the um, uh, eatables so no outside eatables to be um, uh, allowed in these patients all hemodialysis should be aware of the testing triage and notification policy it is very important it is it is a notifiable disease and every patient has to be informed to your health authorities uh, uh, like in delhi we have uh, ministry of health then even in the, at the central level you have um, ministry of health and family welfare and if somehow somebody doesn't explain notified it then can be can be a serious fir against you and police section already we have faced this in in delhi in one of the hospitals so be very careful in notifying the every uh, patient who becomes positive there is a proper form available for every center that is icmr form that form has to be filled and another is if unfortunately some death occurs then how to dispose of the death dead body again is very important a proper pouch has to be there you have to inform and whether that uh, how to cremate the body where to cremate the body all these things you should know rather than just handing over the uh, dead body to the attendants and then uh, creating the spread in the community as far as treatment prophylaxis is concerned suppose you uh, some uh, patient becomes positive in your dialysis unit then there are various uh, limited data as far as hcus is concerned and we don't have any randomized control study and what whether it is a fact or fiction whatever it is the uh, practical point is the uh, the practice is that most of the places are already using hcus as a prophylactic dose 400 bd on the day one if there is exposure and then after that 400 mg once a week till the pandemic uh, settles that is a uh, and we know as an nephrologist in sle we are using this um, hydro uh, sqs for years together rheumatoid arthritis patient are using it for years together so it is a quite safe drug and uh, although i don't uh, actually can't recommend it because we don't have the solid evidence for that but i can also say that there is no harm in in, in one of edta uh, study they have even shown in uh, dialysis patient also a, a 200 mg after every dialysis if patient is exposed to uh, uh, this hcqs and uh, uh, for healthcare i already i have mentioned the dose 400 bd first day and then once a week but you should be very careful especially when you use it in combination with azithromycin then there it can cause prolongation of qt interval and uh, of course eye changes are there if you use it for longer time but not for if you are using it for a short duration now there are uh, we have a large population patient who are on capd also one advantage of capd patients is that there is a very real social distancing already in these patients as far as hygiene is concerned definitely these patients are much more uh, concerned and knowledgeable about personal hygiene and sanitization so that advantage is there so the recommendation is that those who are on pd continue pd only and as far as once they become positive then you have to uh, continue same practice but only thing is that dialysis bags and tubing should be then uh, disposed of after sprinkling 1% hypochlorite solution in the bag then dispose of it in a sealed bag and the fluid should be drained in the flush avoid putting new patients on capd in fact now these days we are not Uh, putting any patient on uh, new insertion or have we have stopped because sometimes there can be risk of and infection spread in the to the anesthetists to the surgeons um, so better not to do at uh, elective surgery during these days acute pd is rec recommended if there is a need where patient cannot be put on hemodialysis 
now coming to acute kidney in, in injury all modalities of renal replacement therapy can be used depending on the clinical status and condition of the patient if hemodialysis preferably do bedside like we most of the patients are in icu and we have uh, four machines uh, kept in icu only so that uh, we, with the ro uh, plant there so we can do the dialysis there only if you don't have that then you can have a uh, small portable ro plant also and so that it can be done there crrt uh, is can be done routinely only thing is that this bad uh, the ba uh, steroid ba uh, bads should be uh, uh, disposed of by putting 1% hypochlorite in the pads other uh, therapies like cytosorb is uh, there are studies which show that cytosorb has been used for tackling the uh, cytokine storm in these patients similarly oxyrhizotis also have been tried but still we don't have many studies but only i think yesterday fda has approved use of cytosorb in patients of ati with with cytokine storms depending upon their uh, interleukin 6 levels and other other markers high volume hemofiltration and adsorption may theoretically be expected to give benefit in these patient in one study uh, a high volume uh, filtration of more than 6 liter per hour showed cytokine reduction and improvement in, in scores in septic patients uh, various uh, this uh, uh, from uh, the references for this study have been from indian society of nephrology right. working group guidelines a chinese society of nephrology uh, guidelines and these are the various papers published in kidney international nature cjsn and uh, one study from cdc uh, uh, i think uh, Yes. Dr. Banda, thank, thank you very much. Very <laughs> exhaustive, and you have covered not only the dialysis population, you have also covered what the acute kidney injury also. Uh, we are running short of time. May I request uh, Professor Sakuja to please speak on the testing lab diagnosis of COVID-19. We also know that CKD patients like in hepatitis or hepatitis c may not develop antibodies adequate antibodies what will be the status of serology test and what should be done in our patient professor sakuja please thank you general verma uh, at the outset i'd like to thank uh, mr raja of uh, micro labs limited and general verma for the kind invitation to participate in this webinar uh, coming to the the next slide please so coming to the lab diagnosis of covid the first question is when do we really test in a patient who is under our care so there are two factors that determine the need for testing one is a travel history or a contact with an affected person within 14 days of the onset of symptoms and the second factor is the occurrence of an acute respiratory illness characterized by fever with cough with or without shortness of breath so what kind of samples do we need for testing the the usual sample that we take is a throat swab so an upper respiratory specimen so this can be from the nasopharynx the oropharynx or from the nasal cavity and positivity rates of 32 to 63% have been reported in one study from samples obtained from these areas if the patient is bringing out sputum even that can be used and in fact sputum samples may have a higher positivity rate of up to 72% in seriously ill patients who are hospitalized a lower respiratory specimen in the form of a bronchoalveolar lavage can also be obtained and can be even more reliable than upper respiratory specimens although the gi tract has also been known to be involved and some uh, laboratories some centers have reported that even the stool may be positive for the virus there isn't much data as yet uh, on such samples even though we know that the proximal tubular epithelium and the podocytes 
are the direct targets of the virus in the kidney, whatever samples of urine have been tested in most centers have turned out to be negative for the virus. May I have the next slide, please? So what is the gold standard for testing on these uh, uh, throat swabs that we take? The test that is the gold standard is the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction for detection of viral RNA. And you can detect four different genes of the virus, the N, E, S, and the RDRP gene. The first line test is testing for the E gene. The confirmatory test is the RDRP gene. And if you want additional confirmation, you use the test for the N gene. Now, uh, it's very important to emphasize here that biosafety guidelines need to be followed during the collection transport and processing of uh, these samples in the lab so that there is no risk of transmission of infection to the workers collecting these samples and processing them in the laboratory. The cost of this testing is approximately rupees 4,500 and each a uh, PCR test takes about two to three hours to carry out. Now, the next slide which you are now seeing refers to the point of care tests, which are of two kinds. The first one is the detection of virus proteins or antigens in the respiratory tract samples. For instance, in in patients with dengue, you test for the NS1 antigen. So similarly, you can test for virus antigens in these uh, throat swab samples. And the second kind of point of care testing is the testing for antibodies in the blood or in the serum. Now, when you're testing for the antigen, the results can be obtained within 30 minutes and the testing is much cheaper than the polymerase chain reaction. However, the sensitivity can be variable. There's oh. very limited data available as yet. There can be false positives because of sharing of antigens with other coronaviruses. And therefore, these, uh, this kind of testing is currently recommended only in research settings and if in future this is found to be reliable, this can reduce the need for polymerase chain reaction testing. The next slide, please. Okay. Next, coming to the okay. antibodies that we test for, the antibody testing response depends on the age of the patient, physical status, the severity of the disease, the medications that the patient is on, and one very important factor is the duration of symptoms. Because the IgM antibody becomes positive somewhere around seven to 10 days after the onset of symptoms, and thereafter show a rising titer, False positives are again possible. The IgG antibodies become positive at 10 to 14 days, and the titer thereafter rises to more than four times that seen in the earlier phases. These antibody titers are critical to support vaccine development and to ensure that the vaccine is really working. Uh, what, is, what kind of antibody response will be obtained in patients who are on dialysis or who are transplant recipients? 
Uh, we know from our uh, experience with hepatitis C and B that uh, many of these patients uh, may not mount a good antibody response. And in such patients, we, have, we may have to depend on the uh, nucleic acid testing alone. Whether these antibodies are protective or pathogenic, we really don't know as yet. Now, coming to the positivity rates of the two antibodies, depending upon the timing after the onset of manifestations, IgM antibodies are positive in only 29% within the first seven days, but are positive in 73% within 8 to 14 days and in 94% at 15 to 39 days after the onset. In contrast, IgG antibodies are positive in 1 to 7 uh, days at in only 19%, in 54% at 8 to 14 days, and in 80% in 59 to 37 to 39 days after the onset of symptoms. And finally, yes, coming to the next slide, what are the other lab tests that one would like to do in uh, these patients? You will you will obviously look at the CBC, the WBC count is usually normal in most patients, but the differential count exhibits a striking lymphopenia. And in patients who have severe disease, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is generally more than 3.1. The platelet count may be slightly below normal. Liver function tests reveal a low albumin level, elevated bilirubin and transaminase levels, and uh, you also can get elevated LDH levels because of organ-specific injury. Uh, in patients with AKI, the creatinine levels are elevated. Uh, in, uh, in many patients who have a lot of inflammatory markers, the CRP, ferritin, and interleukin-6 levels are elevated. Troponin levels may be elevated. T-dimer levels are elevated. And the prothrombin time is prolonged. The procalcitonin levels remain normal unless there is a associated significant bacterial infection. Obviously, you're going to need regular monitoring of the oxygen saturation, the arterial blood gases, you will require x-rays of the chest, you may even need an HRCT to delineate the radiological findings in the lungs better. You need ECG for monitoring of the QTC interval. You may need uh, echocardiography to monitor the uh, cardiac function and blood cultures uh, to look for superimposed bacterial infections. You need urine examinations to look for proteinuria and hematuria. And in rare instances, you may also need to look at complement levels and look for antiphospholipid antibodies. The last slide, please. And how does one confirm that the patient is now cured or uh, totally uh, non-infective and therefore can be discharged from the hospital? So you need to do a PCR on the throat swab again. And if it is negative on two samples on two consecutive days, then you can declare the patient as cured, and non-infectious. Thank you very much indeed, and I'll, happy, I'll be happy to take up any questions that come up in during Thank the Thank you, Mr. Skoja, for a wonderful and a very brief mention about the test and what you are trying to mention that 
possibly we will remain dependent on reverse transcriptase PCR only. Uh, now, the last speaker, but uh, people are looking forward to hear him, is Dr. Professor Dr. Vijay K. So, Dr. Varmaji, just to uh, interrupt for a minute, there are about 26 questions so far on the panel. So, just wanted to remind you, we'll take it up at the end. All right. So, so I'll request Professor Vijay K. to talk about renal transplantation. There are varied questions, and some of the questions which are coming, which I've been going through, people are asking, is there any drug which we can give? What should we do in transplant patients? Should we stop immunosuppression? Should we reduce immunosuppression? And what, how we should go about that? Professor Vijay K. Uh, at the outset, uh, I must thank uh, Mr. Raja and uh, General Verma for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, uh, well, transplantation, uh, before I start about the transplantation and COVID infection, I think it's very important. We may be talking about today, this is an extremely dynamic uh, kind of a field and changing every day. So you never know as to what is going to be new tomorrow. Uh, so be keep tuned and you will see new information coming. So what I may be speaking right now, may change totally in two days' time. Next slide, please. Uh, the agenda I have is that the general guidelines related to kidney transplantation, guidelines for disease kidney transplantation, living donor kidney transplantation, what should we do for transplant procedures? What's the overall experience of uh, COVID infection in transplant patients and drugs, if any, which Dr. Verma was talking about, is there anything good for prophylaxis or for treatment? Next one, please. Uh, I have taken the transplantation guidelines which were published in uh, transplantation. This is the TTS guidelines, actually. And they say that actually this is an infection which spreads from patient to patient and patient to healthcare worker and healthcare worker to patient. So human to human transmission. So therefore, you need strict infection prevention practices. Next, next, please. So over the next few slides are basically the guidelines which the Transplantation Society has given. And these may change. There are no travel at the moment happening across the world, most of the places. So all patients who have returned from countries with more than 10 infected patients and have been exposed to a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19 within the previous 14 days, they should avoid elective clinic visits or any procedure, surgical uh, plans to be should be in place if there is a laboratory testing which is required during the 14 days in such a way so they avoid potential exposure to the other patients. So it's it's important to keep the general guidelines about testing and other things also intact in these patients as well. Next one, please. Patients who are suspected COVID-19 or who require testing to rule out COVID-19 should wear a surgical mask, be placed in isolation, have evaluation and testing coordinated in infection control or transplant ID, which are consistent with the local guidelines as such also. Every uh, country has given guidelines uh, uh, for these and therefore these guidelines need to be followed. Uh, they may vary from state to state as well as from country to country. Next one, please. This is true also for the staff who have traveled and uh, those people who have traveled and where they have traveled to a country with uh, COVID infection or where there have been confirmed cases or there is a suspicion of COVID infection within the last 14 days, then they need to be quarantined as of now for our guidelines in this country and can be seen the patients only after 14 days and then COVID, uh, they've been found to be COVID negative or didn't develop any symptoms. Down. Next one, please. Teams that follow local health department guidelines for isolation, quarantine, testing and monitoring uh, especially for people who have returned from 
these endemic areas. Next one. Now for disease donor, the Transplantation Society suggests that persons who have returned from countries with more than 10 infected COVID patients or have been exposed to a patient with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 patient within the 14 days should not be accepted as a donor. So uh, many countries have in fact suspended, especially the ones where there is heavy COVID infection rates. Uh, most of these people have suspended doing disease donor transplants for time being, as well as living donor transplantation. Only uh, emergency living donor transplants are being done, and these are also very few. So by and large, the guidelines at the moment suggest that we should suspend transplant programs, uh, both diseased as well as living donor transplantation and the guidelines for the next two slides similar that do not do transplantation uh, both diseased and uh, donor transplantation in areas where there is uh, active COVID infection uh, in large number of patients. Next one please. So I will go over the next please, quickly. Next one. Next one. When I go over them quickly, because they are predominantly the same kind of uh, things that there should be a suspension of living donor transplantation also. Uh, and then many countries have necessitated that if we do a transplantation, then both the donor and the recipient must be tested for COVID uh, RNA testing. And once it's found to be negative only, then they should go ahead and do a transplant. Next In countries with widespread community transmission, temporary suspicion, suspension of the living donor kidney and liver transplant program should be considered when donation can safely be deferred to a later date. Next one. Where avail available, testing for upper and lower airway specimen for either by PC or by NAT, of donors, where there is a concern for COVID infection, this should be considered. And some national guidelines recommend routine testing for donors uh, as well as recipients for COVID-2 infection. Next. Next. If transplantation is required, life-saving procedure, then it can be done, and but by and large, most societies have recommended at this point of time that in countries where there is uh, COVID infection occurring, transplantation program should be considered. Now, what should be done for transplant recipients? Like all persons, transplant recipients should adhere to travel advisories issued by their respective health authorities and government bodies. This may necessitate postponing travel to countries more than 10 infected patients. Recipients should avoid travel to all locations where there is COVID infection currently. And transplant recipients should avoid all two trips. Next one. The Transplantation Society also suggests that transplant units should be prepared to receive patients who for various reasons have been abroad. They should be housed in single rooms with attached bathroom and all staff attending to them should be in full PPE until infection with COVID-19 is ruled out. Close liaison is needed with the departments like infectious disease as well as radiology whose services might be needed uh, in these patients. Next one. Mm -hmm. An effort to rearrange scheduling of patients must be needed for their appointments in the in the unit. The incubation period, the asymptomatic shedder, negative PCRs early in the course of disease combine to make out ruling out a patient who has a COVID infection extremely difficult. So therefore, one must, as Dr. Bala said, 
hypodialysis patients that at the moment we must consider all patients to be COVID positive because we are not testing everybody and therefore it's very essential for us to consider them to be COVID positive and use all the precautions for the patients as well as for the healthcare workers uh, so that they should wear a mask, hand washing, social distancing, all of these must be taken care of in these patients as well. As these patients are uh, more prone to get infection and once they get infection they are at high risk of getting severe infections as well as there is high mortality in these patients as we can see. Next, Next one. Uh, the transplant patients who have fever or respiratory symptoms should be... Can I go to the previous one? We have previous one. Yes. Transplant patients with fever or respiratory symptoms should be instructed to call the transplant center and avoid presenting to the clinic. To avoid inactivity, they got into the emergency in an area where they can be seen and a possible COVID infection rules out before they can be examined as regular patients. Transplant centers should also develop guidelines uh, for symptomatic patients if they need evaluation, testing, and management. Already on March, and they, they are likely that they might get changed again very soon. Next one, please. Now, what has been the kind of an experience? Next one. Vinay, next one. Yes. What has been the kind of experience of transplant centers? Can I go to the previous one? I think there's some problem with the moving the slides. Can I show this? Yes, yes, stay there. Uh, well, there have been two studies that have not yet uh, come into the print, but they are in the pre-print uh, state. If both are in uh, Kidney International. One study came from St. George's Hospital by Dr. Banerjee and uh, Panish, Panish who worked with us. Uh, these were seven patients uh, who were admitted in St. George's patient, uh, St. George's Hospital in UK. Uh, two patients were, uh, these were transplant recipients who developed COVID-19 in infection. Two patients were managed at home. Five patients were hospitalized. Four patients required ICU admission and one out of the seven patients died, which gives you a mortality of about 14%. This is another study which is of uh, 20 kidney transplant patients. This is from Brescia and these are 20 kidney transplant patients and you can see that uh, in the majority of these patients immunosuppression was withdrawn. 87% uh, of the patients had worsening of the chest x-ray. 85% of the patients, 11 of the 13 were the Immunosuppression was withdrawn. Escalation of the oxygen therapy occurred. They were given dexamethasone in 11. Tocilizumab, uh, which is an IL-6 receptor. Um, Anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibody was given in six patients. Uh, methylprednisolone, lopinavir, retinavir, four out of these 20 patients. Doctor, we are not able to you properly. Six develop acute kidney, five out of the 20 I'm patients. A uh, lot of experience that we have so far in the literature. Patients. Uh, from Italy and seven patients uh, from this year. 
what is quite clear when patients have a general model in this uh, uh, patient. Professor Kir, your voice is breaking. But in the Dr. Kerr, uh, your voice is uh, breaking, so maybe some signal issues. I think we lost uh, this talk. I think we lost his connection. Uh, Vinay, uh, maybe, can see? Yeah, I can see him. Maybe the internet is slow on, on this side. So. Sir, in the meanwhile, uh, Dr. Varmaji, you would like to take up one or two questions. Professor Kerr, uh, is Professor Kerr with us? Hello. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, yeah, can you are audible hear, now. Hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, the, the, the next slide actually is the, is the last slide. See this, and Dr. Dr. Vama has also said that are there any drugs? which can be given to transplant patients. And as you had seen that actually, uh, the Italian experience suggested that uh, that they had given, these patients were very sick and they have been about six patients. They, they had withdrawn immunosuppression uh, in majority of the patients. In the St. George's Hospital, they had and they are of response if these patients go COVID infection. I think we should the microphenolate morphotel or the uh, uh, as it happened if these patients are on those, uh, we should reduce. Uh, tetralomas and in, maybe probably in zeros for some period of time like we do for any other infection. Uh, there are centers which have withdrawn immunosuppression. There may be partial reduction of immunosuppression. And one should know that once these patients get better, when should you get them back on these immunosuppressive drugs? It's not very clear from the studies that have yet. But like we treat any other patients, once they cover their function significantly and the infection looks to be uh, better, then probably one should start, uh, at least if the tetralomus was withdrawn, one should go with tetralomus first with and then maybe later on introduce the uh, uh, microphenolate morbidal uh, that needs to be done. Obviously, these patients need to be isolated. And if they pay, these patients become sick, then obviously other therapies may be needed, like for acute kidney injury, supportive care, and uh, rest of the care might be needed. Uh, next one, please. Well, the drugs we've been used, as you had seen in the studies, is chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, Ramadesavid, there is a, a study which came in New England Journal of Medicine that Ramadesavid may be the drug. People have used other antiviral drugs. Ivermectin has also been. Uh, at the moment, we do not have any randomized trials, so we will not be able to say that which drug is effective. Fortunately, as Dr. Sunil Prakash said, that there are a large number of randomized trials which are going on. Uh, drugs like uh, remdesivir and antiviral drugs, hydroxychloroquine, uh, we all in randomized trials. The drugs including uh, losartan and angiotensin receptor blockers, as Dr. Verma was talking about at that point of time, suggesting that these drugs may have some positive effect. And people have even repurposing, uh, sort of trying to look at newer drugs which could be beneficial and is a type of in fact, it has also been found that this may be a drug which might be effective. And it would be very interesting to see data that transplant patients who are on azathioprine, have they behaved differently? And those who are late mobile and other things. So with this game, uh, if there are uh, any other questions, then we would be able to do it. We'd be glad to do that. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kher. So what I think before we go to question answer, you can summarize what you, we know today is possibly reduce immunosuppression in a transplant patient if he develops COVID infection. And your recommendation will be we cut down MMF, reduce Tecro, carry on with steroids, and at a later date, we once the person is all right, we reintroduce them. Is that what you will recommend now? That, that's what that's what would be. That's what we do for other infections as well. Severe yeah. infections, we would stop uh, the uh, proliferative, anti-proliferative drugs uh, like mycophenolate, mobstil, or azotherapy, and, and uh, continue tetralumus. Steroids have been used, uh, and many people have said that steroids may be useful in patients with COVID infection, so there is a debate going on about that. I, I think I would continue with a slightly higher level of steroids. Uh, uh, reduce the problems, take off mycophenolate marketing, uh, and uh, till they get better. Hopefully, we should be able to, if they are not very severely symptomatic, we should be able to manage these patients in home isolation and they may not be hospitalized. But those who are sick enough, they might have to be hospitalized, and those who need ICU admission might have to be taken into the ICU. I think I'll start with the Professor Sakuja. There are a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, how the false positive is there in IgM in COVID cases. Number two question is, will you recommend routine screening of patients who are coming for dialysis from other centers? Uh, taking the second question first, because that's uh, quite straightforward. Uh, we had taken a decision at our center not to accept any new patients on maintenance dialysis at our center during the period uh, of this uh, pandemic. Uh, however, uh, that does create uh, practical problems for patients. Obviously, they cannot be denied access to dialysis. So, uh, so that may not be the, the correct decision uh, in all instances. I think if you want to accept a, a new patient coming from another center on your maintenance dialysis program, uh, what you should do is make sure that he has no travel history to, a, to an area which is uh, seriously affected or a contact with a known patient and has no symptoms to suggest COVID-19 infection. And in such a situation, I think the patient can be accepted. Of course, if you have any doubt about a COVID infection in such a patient, then do the usual tests and only then accept the patient onto your program. False positive and, IgM? Yeah, false positive IgM. See, the, see, what uh, I'd like to emphasize as far as uh, the antibody testing is concerned, that as yet, the information, the data that we have with regard to antibody testing is really very scanty. We are not even sure about uh, the source of those antibody kits. Um, even in India, the antibody kits have just become available maybe a day or two ago. Until then, they were not available. So we really have no data on patients in India that we can rely on as yet. Some of these kits are coming from China. Some of these are probably manufactured by Abbott. So we really don't know a about what the performance of these kits is going to be like. So it's only once we have more data uh, that we'll be really be able to be sure about the reliability of antibody testing, whether it is IgM or IgG. So at the moment to say that uh, we'll be able to uh, give you reliable answers on antibody testing I think it's not possible. Thank you very much. Dr. Bhalla, yes. uh, there is a question. How will you give HD as an OPD case to a COVID-positive patient? And second is, 
Uh, do you recommend the heparin dose should be increased because people have started noting that the clotting is more in COVID positive patients? Do you recommend those? As I already mentioned <coughs> in my guidelines. Please scan the questions so you can take over and start. As I already the... mentioned in my guidelines, if you have a COVID positive facility separate from your main negative unit, that is the ideal, ideal situation. If you have a COVID positive separate facility, if that is not available, then set, second is a, a separate room in your, in your parent hemodialysis unit with all PPE precautions in level three. And if you don't have even that, then last shift of the day with formalization and sanitization. Uh, that I is personally how... feel the question what has come because this situation will not be there for a very long time. Yes. If a person is COVID positive, possibly it is a question of days and possibly he will be requiring hospitalization most of the time because this is a matter of a couple of days. Either the disease will clear off or he will succumb. So possibly this question may not be very relevant, but as you rightly said, if possible, we can give it in isolation. Yes, uh, but so otherwise ICU... ICU admission. Otherwise, what practically what we will be doing actually is that if these patients are in ICU setting, then def and we, these patients will be getting dialysis in ICU. Right now, uh, heparin dose. Yes. Any uh, uh, th there is no recommendation for increasing that, uh, giving higher doses or giving TPA or other uh, um, uh, therapies in these patients. That is only being used for ATI in ICU settings, uh, cytotoms, uh, cytokine storms but not in maintenance hemodialysis patient and anticoagulation. Right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sunil only, Prakash, uh, only there are two, three questions. Only who have D-dimer positive. Only if if D-dimer is uh, positive. very, very high. Then yes, then you may require more heparin. Sir, those patients will be yeah. in uh, ICU setting, yes, having sir. not in a maintenance hemodialysis patient. Not, not maintenance now, I, do, I don't know uh, what, what Dr. Skuja earlier answered. The policy at, in Delhi, at least in our center is, I must share, that no outside patient will be accepted for hemodialysis unit. No, I think because, this is a policy. Because, most, most, uh, of, uh, Bhalla, most of the centers are adopting that. Nahin, uh, but you are also aware, few of the centers have got closed. So nahin, Dr. Verma, let, me, let me complete. The, because these patients are coming from the centers which have been closed. Yeah. So now these patients are wandering around uh, the different centers. Now, if God forbid, if this patient becomes positive, and today you have even tested, and on test this patient is negative, but he is in, still in incubation period, it is very likely that he has already contracted infection in that previous center. So I, th I agree with Dr. Skuja's initial part, first part, that it is better not to accept, we are having 200 plus patients on maintenance dialysis in our center. You are risking the closure of your center just for this one patient addition. I, I, I will strongly support that, that view. Or what we are doing is we are keeping this patient in, uh, for observation in our fever clinic. And we send a, in an asymptomatic patient, I'm saying, we send the COVID test. If it, we send in the morning, we get the report in the evening. Once we get the negative report, we accept this patient on dialysis, but then you have to repeat the, this test hour after five days or seven days. I think the, the answer is pretty clear. What you rightly said, that you might be forced to accept but accept it after doing a test. And again, you are retesting. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sunil Prakash, uh, the mm -hmm. questions are a couple of questions. One, people want to know, let's be very clear, is there increased risk of AKI or not? Number two, if the risk of AKI is more, patients who require HD, do they have higher mortality? Number three, uh, any drug, you will recommend for critical cases? Uh, by design, I put in all papers because the jury is not yet out about the prevalence of AKI in COVID. And the European data and the US data is yet to be brought to print. We have only Chinese data to look back upon. But if I have to rationalize in one sentence, I would say the prevalence of a pure AKI is around 4.5, 5.5, something like that. Please remember that most of these patients have comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension, and they do have some mild CKD. That is why in slides, you must be wondering that proteinuria and uh, hematuria and deranged KFT was like 15 to 20%.
but in lang study also they said aki is 4.5% so to reiterate your aki would be anything between 3 to 7% a mean would be say uh, ball point answer would be 5% but there is going to be a huge variation and we must wait for the european and the us data to get a bigger picture that is one thing and uh, the second thing is uh, it was about uh, what general verma uh, any critical any drug you will recommend for critical cases no i'm i really i'm not convinced about the data which is still there people are giving uh, scqs and azithromycin because they are available and they are cheap but uh, we have not yet uh, have any evidence to suggest that these things will help i think once the patient reaches in critical state which means that he is on uh, continuous renal replacement therapies or he is on cytokine removal he is on ventilation he is on prone ventilation he may may not be on ecmo we all know that there is a very very guarded prognosis in these patients so in icu setting as of now i am unable to recommend any drug all right what about convalescent plasma i think that is something that uh, is now going to be the yes. subject yes. of uh, yes. randomized control yes. trials yes so number yeah. one and number two we are considering right. number two i agree with because Prof. the antibody test is just appearing in india yes. and it is only once the antibody test is there you yes. are able to test that people who have recovered and they have got enough antibodies only then the plasma can be taken yes so, igg uh, antibody Yeah, so Professor Kheer, I think you can start the questions. I just finish one more thing. There yeah. is a very interesting paper from Keith et al. and he has done flex in these patients, and a study of twenty patients, and they have shown some better results in such critical ICU patients. Flex. Professor Kheer. Yeah, I think uh, one of the questions is that uh, if a COVID infection occurs in the transplant recipient and the patient is within the three months of the transplant. Transplant, and in fact, actually, uh, both studies which have which are about to be published, uh, one is Saint George's study. Uh, two patients out of the seven were within the first three months of the transplantation, and even in these patients, uh, I I can understand the person who asked probably is asking that when we are talking of stopping mycophenolate morphotil within the first three months of the transplantation. uh the chances of a rejection and all that but when we are talking of an infection severe infection like covid or any other such severe infection i think it's very important for us to save the patient rather than worry too much about the rejection at that point of time uh it's important to take off mycophenolate morphotil and i would continue with the uh, guidance that was done and this is exactly what was done in st george's uh, experience also they stopped mycophenolate morphotil and they continued only dual immunosuppression in these patients and two of these patients were within the first three months even in the italian experience of 20 patients about three patients were within the first three months of this and they had discontinued immunosuppression in these patients because two of these patients were quite sick and these patients and one of these three patients died otherwise other two patients uh, uh, in whom the immunosuppression was uh, taken off these patients recovered in order so i i think uh, it's very clear that the response in patients who develop uh, covid in transplant recipients i would cut down the immunosuppression Uh, stop mycophenolate morphotil. That would be okay. Uh, Dr. Kher, are you convinced? And Dr. Bhalla, are you convinced that the CKD patients have got a minor disease if they are infested with COVID? At the moment, I think the experience uh, of whatever is published suggests that they do. And it's quite possible that because many of our patients do not have immunologically very competent, they are immunologically suppressed. and a lot of damage which occurs in patients with covid infection occurs because of the immune reaction and the inflammatory reaction which occurs uh, with uh, these patients of the immune uh, attack that the body launches and the cytokine storm which occurs and um, many of our patients may not be may not be able to launch that kind of attack 
obviously this is variable. The question is why probably why this scenario not in transplant patient. They are also same disabilities they have got. Yeah, they are also I, I, compromised. And mind you, one of the center I was talking in formal talk in US, they are believing that this immunosuppression should be continued. They feel that by continuing immunosuppression, we might be able to salvage patients because then they will not uh, mount the antibody response. I mean, I mean, there are different theories. Anyway, yes. Now, I, I don't know. I, I think the jury is out. I don't know whether we know for sure as to what is the experience of uh, dialysis and CKD patients. We will have more data. This is only a small kind of a data. All data is at the moment from I mean, China. So we do not know what yes. will be the kind of data which will be coming. One question, <laughs> Professor Puja, is coming. What do you, I, I, I mean, we are not. Um, the horoscopist and we cannot read the future. People are asking, what do you read about the pandemic? How long it is going to continue? And the corollary to Dr. Kher is that after Dr. Sakuja, that if this is continuing for over two months, three months, what do you think? When should we restart transplant with due precautions? Uh, I think it's... Uh extremely difficult at the present moment to predict what is going to happen in the near future. Um, it's more an expression of hope and optimism that, uh, that I'm saying that maybe in the next uh, three or four weeks, we'll see a decline in the number of infections in our country and uh, then uh, the, the lockdown can be opened up in stages. However, I'm um, not at all absolutely sure of that. I think I'm very uncertain as yet. Uh, I, I, yes, I would agree with Vinay that it's, it's very difficult to predict as to how this is going to pan out. But knowing from previous pandemics as well as epidemics, this virus is here to stay. I don't think it's going to go away uh, till we find either a vaccine for this or a drug by which we can reduce the infectivity of this virus uh, drastically. So I think we will have to, over a period of time, I don't know how soon that is going to be. I do hope that the lockdown produces at least the kind of an expected effect that uh, most of us and the Prime Minister and everybody else is wanting is to reduce the number of infections to such levels that we might be able to have a staggered, a cheered kind of uh, reinitiation into our uh, practice. And I think I would feel that we will have to learn to live with this virus yeah. and yeah. deal with this virus like we have done with other viruses as well, although they were not as infective like h one one but that wasn't as infective. That didn't go into this kind of a proportion of pandemic. But I think uh, ultimately a herd immunity has to develop till we get the vaccine. And we will have to deal with it. I, I, I think we will have to... Yeah. The way we time. will have to practice will be different now. It will not be the same. I don't expect that we are going to mass and the hand washing and the other precautions that are currently going on will have to be a way of life for us for another six months, maybe a year or so too, till we get a vaccine. That's what I would predict. Right, right. Uh, now, the question to anyone, because some of the people have asked, personal experience of any patient, any of you are our patient, had COVID positive dialysis or transplant. I can say one of my patients, uh, of dialysis, had COVID. Uh, actually, he was not on dialysis. This uh, gentleman, 80-year-old, had come to our hospital last week. To be exact, 7th of last month. Today is 14th. I examined him on 7th, 8th, and 9th. The chest x-ray was totally clear when he came. He had not started the dialysis. We thought that the first uremic encephalopathy. We dialyzed him on 7th and 8th. Ninth, we suddenly found x-ray, which was totally clear. It became totally flooded. So that is when we suspected. We got an 
X-ray done. X-ray we had seen that, and that is the day there was a severe lymphopenia, and before we could do anything, patient was shifted to ICU. By that time, COVID test was not there. He was ventilated. Eventually, he died, and uh, I am also in quarantine for him. As a matter of fact, so there are anybody having personal experience with any COVID transplant or dialysis patient. We, so we, had, our, we had one patient uh, in ICU, not admitted under us, but uh, we were on call. So we dialyzed that patient and uh, we had given only one dialysis. And once the report came positive, it was referred from other hospital where uh, this patient was there for some, about 20 days. So within 24 hours, we made the diagnosis. We gave him only one dialysis and after that referred this patient to RML hospital. From where this patient, they attended took this patient Lama and then ultimately died. So, but the um, uh, whole ICU staff and our technicians and doctors um, were in quarantine, but uh, luckily all of them um, uh, came not negative. Any other experience with that? Yes, one of my, our patients also, uh, dialysis patient had uh, COVID positive, but he did well and uh, he, he is on dialysis. He is uh, still admitted in the, in the hospital and getting dialysis done. Uh, we have a COVID ICU and we are dialyzing him. Although he is in a, he is on the floor, we bring him down and we have like uh, Dr. Balla had talked about, uh, uh, one separate wing is created as a COVID positive wing and the elevators and all the entries are different in that wing. And there, so he gets dialyzed in that side and that's how we are dialyzed. But he's doing well. Dr. Kher, what were the presenting symptoms of that patient? That patient had pneumonia and cough and fever. Dr. Sunil Prakash, the question is, has any patient, literature-wise, COVID patient presented with nephritic or nephrotic illness? Uh, and if is, such a patient... Yeah, there is, actually, there is a, there is a uh, autopsy uh, which has been done in uh, in, uh, I was reading it uh, somewhere and they found that collapsing, collapsing uh, uh, FSGS, collapsing yeah. FSGS, as well as they demonstrated the virions in the porocytes as well as in the in the yeah. tubular cell, like uh, Vinay had also talked about. Yeah, and F so F collapsing. African, yeah, this so was the African and American. FSGS. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, with this case report came. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add two points. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you are very much audible. I'm just wanting to add two points that in transplant now there are a lot of yes, people yes. which are coming, are. which are suggesting that uh, CNI should be kept on the upper normal side and cyclosporine may do better than tacrolimus because of the path which cyclosporine takes is less uh, affected by the COVID interference. And number two, when we end up doing dialysis of such patients in ICU and critical care wards, we are not to be guided by BU and creatinine levels. Our guidance should be by hydration. These people land up into overhydration states, which are getting worse by their uh, need to keep in prone positions and further interventions and uh, so on and so forth. So they have to be kept little volume deplete to save the lungs. Here the priorities will go to the lungs. These are the two points I wanted to keep. Uh, Doctor, uh, doc, uh, Professor Khair, any questions? Other you would like to? No, I, I, I think, I think that. Dr. Uh, Burma, someone has about... asked. Someone has asked about one question: How much is the incidence of viremia? Right. Incidence of viremia. Yeah, in this patient. Uh, Professor Sahuja, any literature on no, that? Uh, no, I, I really don't have an answer to that question. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, testing on blood samples has not been recommended. The, the, the PCR is done on the uh, upper respiratory samples, but not on blood samples. So most likely, as far as I'm aware, blood samples will be negative in most patients. Right. Uh, Mr. Raja, is there... Yes. Can we, anybody, audience, if somebody wants to ask any question, do we have a provision? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they can. They can yeah, Dr. Chittaranjan Kar is online.
Yeah, anybody. Who wants to ask the last five ask. minutes, I think we should give to them. Correct. Yeah, uh, Mr. Vinay, can you just uh, unmute? Good, good evening. Can, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, Chitranjan, you are audible. Yeah. Sir, I thank all the panelists for a very lucid illustration of these topics. I just wanted to ask one question to Professor uh, Vinay Sakuja. What about the resurgence of cases in South Korea and some cases in China, China, China. that they are again testing positive after they have tested negative twice? So what are the possible causes for that and can that phenomena also happen in India? Uh, I'm not aware of uh, what, what you are talking about, but uh, it is possible. As I mentioned earlier, it's not really known whether the antibodies that we develop are protective or not. We are not yet sure about this. And only time will tell uh, whether the development of an IgG antibody is truly protective against future infection or not. The answer to the question that you have asked depends on that precisely. And I don't think we have a clear answer yet. Any other question? There is one. Yeah. Uh, so there is one question from Dr. Rasi Arvind. Right. Uh, he talks, yeah. Uh, he, uh, yeah. Dr. Kanchi, is he there? I think he's, he's not, but he has typed, he has left the question. Today, the UK renal registry has published data that shows a high prevalence and mortality related to SARS in dialysis patients. 926 new cases of SARS have been identified this week in dialysis patients with a mortality at two weeks of 15 percentage. Given this, shouldn't we classify patients as normal, suspected COVID, COVID positive patients and have three separate areas for dialysis? This is a query from Arvind Kanchi. No, this is not a query. He has made a comment. That possibly what we are trying to say that the disease is milder in patients on dialysis. He is mentioning that there's a study of 926 patients where the death rate is almost 15 percent. You said I have not read that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mentioned as 15 percent. 15 percent. Yeah. Yeah. This is that's what I was talking about. That we do not know yet. Uh, this was the Chinese experience and some of the studies which have been published, but there is going to be a huge amount of literature which is going to change. And I think, uh, I don't think we can make any comments at the moment about whether the disease is going to be mild in patients with uh, dialysis or so. At the moment, the, the studies which we looked at did suggest that that's so, but more data might come from the Western world the U.S. as well as from the Italy as yet, and they might talk of totally different kind of uh, outcomes in these patients. So we will have to keep you to new information. Uh, doc, this is a question for Dr. Sakuja. Will the IgM antibody cross-react with other viruses like influenza or rhinovirus? Putting it in other way, what is the antigen target for these IgM or IgG tests? And the yeah, role of convalescent plasma infusion. Yeah, con convalescent plasma we already talked about. Uh, a definite role is not at, at all as yet established, but uh, centers are already starting trials of convalescent plasma infusions in seriously ill patients. And I am told even the PGI is planning such a trial. Uh, but we really don't know whether this will work or not as yet. As far as IgM antibodies uh, are concerned, yes. Uh, the possibility that these can be false positive has not been ruled out because it's possible that there are shared antigens between COVID-19 and other coronaviruses or even viruses other than coronaviruses. And so the, that possibility still cannot be ruled out. Uh, thank you very I much. Think there, there was a question about continuation of ACE inhibitors or ARBs in patients because you did talk about yeah. the ACE2 getting, getting overexpressed, uh, in, the especially in patients. Remain, with 
But at, I think the recommendations at the moment are that we should continue, continue this, continue this, the European guidelines as well as the American Heart Association guidelines yeah, also. They recommend continue. continue I think we don't know how they are beneficial, who, but they yes. are beneficial. Rather, there's a in trial fact, I, which has started of using low starter, in patients. Low, low starter, I told you. Yes. Na, there are some newer drugs which are looking at. People were talking about immunosuppressive drugs like cyclosporin being better than tacrolimus. But I think drug which is of interest would be sirolimus because that has been shown to be a drug which might be, has antiviral activities and maybe a useful drug to look at uh, in COVID-19 infection. Mercaptopurin has come out as a drug which might look like to be a good drug. So it would be interesting to see I talked about it, that what happens in patients with azathioprine and all that. So, so it looks like that new, some of these newer drugs might produce beneficial effects. We don't know yet. I, I think there are many questions. There are, uh, I, I can see 67 questions still lying. Uh, Mr. Raja, do we have time or we have to wind no. up? Maybe another we two should. questions uh, we can take up, sir. One frequently question I see is that regarding the use of VRB and uh, ACE. That answer has been given by Professor K that the recommendation by American College of Cardiology and European Society of Hypertension and Cardiology is continue ACE and ARB if a person is taking. The overexpression of these ACE receptor is beneficial. If you block or delete the ACE receptor, the disease is more severe. I'll I, anyway, I, we will go for last three questions. Let me see. Uh, uh, I think this has been answered. Mr. Dr. Indranil Ghosh is asking, is there a role of plasma pheresis or immunoadsorption followed by plasma infusion? Dr. Sunil Prakash. Uh, plasma exchange has, there has been a big paper by Keith et al. But uh, Dr. Uh, Sakuja had already pointed out about uh, plasma infusion and uh, at this point of time at least uh, there are some good papers which are suggesting its convalescent role but we have to be more look out for more data to come up both for plasma infusion as well as plasma action but i believe plasma infusion will really help these very heavily immunocompromised patients uh, so that is why, question. More, why more young population is infected in India? Because India is a young population country. Yeah, it's it's not younger, younger nation younger. of younger people. Yeah. So what you have will get infected. Uh, yes. Professor, Professor, for Professor Sakuja, does this sputum PCR need specific collection method? Uh, no, the only uh, thing that you have to be careful when you are taking the sample is that the swab should touch the posterior pharyngeal wall and take the sample from there. So it should not just touch the tongue or the palate and take a saliva sample. That would be, uh, that would be relatively uh, unlikely to be positive then. You will get false negatives. So the sample should be from deep inside the pharynx and uh, uh, what, what people have advocated so that the patient does not uh, transmit infection to the staff and to other people around him, that there should be a drive-in facility to the collection center. The patient drives to that point, opens the window pane of the vehicle, opens his wide mouth, uh, mouth wide as possible. The uh, collection staff, staff takes a deep pharyngeal swab and then the patient drives out of the uh, area so, so that there is minimum exposure to anybody else. So that is the main thing that has to be done carefully. Sir, is the swab taken from nostrils also after yes, the yes, collection? Yes, yes, yes. yes. You both, can take it both. from the, the nostrils also, the nasopharynx also, but the most common site, the easiest site to sample is the oropharynx. Now, as Professor Kuja has mentioned, you have to take specimen both.
from oropharynx also from nasopharynx also rather the yield from nasopharynx is more than oropharynx uh, now uh, last question somebody has asked is hot weather going to be beneficial <laughs> <laughs> we hope That's we a hope million dollar we question hope, we hope time will tell sir one question uh, from uh, dr pankaj hans any yeah. data on usage of daa against hcv usage in in vitro patients any data any? on usage of the daa against yeah. hcv usage there are other other antiviral drugs which have been used remdesivir has been used ritonavir has been lopinavir has been used so these are drugs but we don't know in a randomized trial they have not been yet shown to be effective yeah. so we don't so know it, whether they are effective it was yesterday only the study came yeah. in nejm where they yeah. tried in 199 patient and yeah, yeah. were given control and 99 were given these antiviral but the result was there was no benefit Yeah, Though yeah. the anti people who received antiviral, they claim the recovery was one day earlier, but it was insignificant. So at the moment, there yeah, is no yeah. recommendation. I think um, uh, we we should close now. Yes, and it yes, has sir. been uh, I have been yes, honored sir. by the presence of such illustrious faculty who have been very cooperative and who have answered the talk prepared by them were superb, and they delivered in a fantastic way. My Um, I am grateful to all of all the faculty thanks members. Thanks to all listeners. Thank you. I you. also, Mr. All Mr. Mr. Sir, I, thanks for a great webinar. Thank you. I also, I also on thank of, Mr. Uh, Raja, Mr. Raja, yes. I think Micro Lab, for organizing this and giving us a opportunity to be here. I hope, with the new knowledge which will be coming, and there are many areas which need to be coming to be covered. Possibly after three to four weeks, we should have another webinar to whatever. recent or whatever latest has been done i hand over to mr sir, yeah sir uh, once again uh, to all the uh, panelists speakers as well as the audience it's uh, in, indeed a pleasure for us because uh, there have been a lot of uh, such covid programs happening across various specialties particularly in id and intensive care uh, specialties but somehow in nephrology we thought that uh, there is a need for for us to really take it to the wide spread of knowledge so that's a small initiative from micro labs i really thank the entire audience for sparing your valuable time and the uh, time taken by all the speakers uh, in preparing their slides within a short notice so i thank once again all the speakers as well as participants for enlightening us and uh, thank you very much and have a wonderful week ahead uh, be thank safe good night be stay thank at you. home thank you very much thank good night all thank you thank you thank you thank very you. much thank you very much Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Verma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balla. Thank you, Sabuja sir. Thank you, Dr. Kier. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. Dr. Dr. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you.